Uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us both in person and online for this Central Wisconsin Book Festival event. We are very happy to have with us Teresa Kaminsky to uh, help us learn more about researching and writing creative nonfiction. Um, Teresa earned her PhD in history from the, oh, I'm sorry, before I introduce our featured guest, let me back up a little bit. I did this earlier today. Uh, support for the 2022 Central Wisconsin Book Festival was provided through the Community Arts Grant Program of North Central Wisconsin with funds provided by the Wisconsin Arts Board, a state agency, the Community Foundation, and the B.A. and Esther Greenheck Foundation. Support also provided in part by Reuter Ware Law Firm, the Dudley Foundation, the Marathon County Public Library Foundation, the Portage County Public Library Foundation, Macmillan Memorial Library, the CoVantage Cares Foundation, Whitewater Music Hall, Marathon County Historical Society. Thank you very much for their help and assistance, both with technology and for hosting this event this afternoon, um, as well as Bound to Happen Books in Stevens Point and Yankee Bookstore here in Wausau. So our featured guest, Teresa, uh, excuse me, Teresa Kaminsky, earned her PhD in history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, specializes in writing about scrappy women in American history, and recently published her fifth book, A Biography of the Entertainer Dale Evans, which she'll be reading from at an event Sunday afternoon, tomorrow afternoon, the 25th at Bound to Happen Books in Stevens Point at one o'clock noon, excuse me, yes. Uh, she also taught at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point for more than 25 years, offering classes on American history, American women's history, and historical research and writing. So we are very happy to have her here. Please welcome both in person and virtually, Teresa Kaminsky. Okay, uh, thanks so much. I I'm sure everybody can hear me. Um, thanks for coming, and I do appreciate the invitation. Um, this is one of my favorite things to talk about uh, writing and researching, which I've been doing for a very long time, um, sometimes a bit more successfully than other times because, um, I don't know, for as often as you publish, there are other times you don't, but the thing that you're constantly doing, of course, is writing. And uh, we'll talk about both of those things today. Um, and I do wanna thank, again, very specifically, the, um, the people who put together the book festival for this opportunity to uh, talk about uh, researching and writing narrative nonfiction. And these are um, three of my most recent books. I did publish two more scholarly books before these, and I'm hoping um, to publish at least one more book. I'm kind of at the beginning of a new project right now. And that's always an exciting place too. So, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Thing. Try it again. Okay. There you go. All right. So I did want to focus today on what's often referred to as narrative nonfiction, but this is an extremely elastic term. Um, and it can incorporate everything from creative nonfiction to more kind of scholarly works as well. But basically, if you are interested in, or if you're already writing um, any form of nonfiction, it has to be a true story. That's where the non comes in with the fiction part. So it is true. And it usually focuses on, at least with narrative, um, if you're writing some sort of prescriptive book, you know, like a how-to book, this might be a bit different. But in narrative nonfiction, since you're telling a story, it is usually about a particular person, maybe a group of people, um, or it may be about a particular event. And that event can be a very large event, maybe World War II, um, or it can be a very small event, um, you know, say a miners strike in southwestern Wisconsin. And the other key factor to this narrative nonfiction, of course, is that it is written 
in a style that's referred to as literary, which of course is also a very elastic and subjective term, but that ties back to the story part of it, that you want this to read like, and I, I do get a little touchy when I hear people say this, that, oh, that nonfiction book was so good, it read just like a novel. Okay, and that's where this literary style comes in because narrative nonfiction does borrow storytelling techniques from fiction. But because I've been so immersed in nonfiction, I just think, well, a good narrative nonfiction tells a good story and it should carry you through. It doesn't have to be like a novel to succeed. It can, and that's fine, but it doesn't have to. Um, but I should also point out here, I have nothing against fiction. I am an avid, especially historical fiction reader. So um, I'm not trying to uh, criticize people who write fiction. It's, it is wonderful, but so is nonfiction. So we can acknowledge both of those. And tying back into that issue about true Good narrative nonfiction is based on good, extensive, solid research. And as an academically trained historian, everything to me has been about research and researching in the right ways, researching in the most comprehensive ways as possible. Because as I learned from academic writing, everything you do there comes back to your research and how good it is. So that's just a basic description. I think for some people who do talk more about creative nonfiction, especially I think a lot of times memoirs are classified more as creative nonfiction. These authors may take a bit more liberty with their truth telling. And um, I have Truman Capote's book in cold blood up there for two reasons. One is that um, he is often referred to as sort of the father of this narrative nonfiction form. He very famously referred to his book as a nonfiction novel. And he kind of acted like it was the first time anybody had ever done this, but you know, that's, that's Truman, that's Truman Capote. And we've also known because, well, at the time the book came out, and then ever since then, literary scholars have been taking the book apart, and understanding how he wrote it, and the fact that he probably did take some liberties with the facts. So um, maybe a cautionary tale, but also a bit of inspiration. It's certainly worth the read. Um, anybody who's never read it, um, it's an astonishing story. So um, when I think of a workshop, I always think of small groups. Um, I always think of tables of people writing and talking about their writing. Uh, we couldn't quite do that today, um, hoping at some point a little bit more post pandemic to get into things like that. But um, I already heard a little bit about uh, Janet's project, and um, I don't know if anybody else wants to share if they're working on something or if they're just here for information. Um, um, I have several ancestors. I'd like to tell their stories, and you know, based on a lot of research, I've been researching um, my ancestors since my late teens. So over 45 years, well, close to 45 years. But um, I, particularly, I have a second great grandfather who immigrated from Germany, uh, was in civil, the Civil War, um, had numerous children by two wives, lived a very long life into the early 1912. Well, actually, he didn't die until 1912, so quite a ways into the 20th century. So I, I just think he's a fascinating person. He, um, with quite a, a story of life. And I do have some like stories from other family members. Oh, great. Uh, so I like, uh, yeah. Oh, great. That, yeah, those kinds of projects are always, um, well, very labor intensive and uh, very satisfying and uh, rewarding, I think, to, to make it through. And that does sound like a good long life. So 
hopefully I'll have some good hints for you on, on what to do. Okay. So, um, and, and some of this may be a little bit basic, and I hope at some point I, I get to move beyond that, but all research has to start somewhere. And today, almost always that means going online somewhere. And I think whatever search engine you're working with, usually the first thing that's going to pop up when you type in a name or a topic, it's going to be Wikipedia. And again, um, not that I have anything against Wikipedia. I actually know a lot of people, um, academically trained scholars who contribute to Wikipedia. So I think the, the quality of the articles that you find there has been increasing very rapidly over the years, but I still really encourage people to use it as a starting point. And I think doing that is absolutely fine. Um, I sometimes do some very quick fact checking on Wikipedia, but like any other source material, I use it as one source and I will almost always then check another source to make sure that it's correct. And that kind of source checking is really what elevates your project beyond someone else's is that you are constantly questioning the information that you're gathering and not just taking it as fact, even if it's between book covers. Okay. Um, and that sometimes can be a hard thing to do because you think, okay, I've got this information that I, that I want. Sometimes if you check another source, you find out it's really not what you want. So I think most of us are familiar with this. And I, I did, I started with a very broad topic. And you know, if you do that in Wikipedia, you're just kind of going to end up drowned in a whole bunch of information. But there are these helpful hyperlinks embedded in there. So you can, um, you can maneuver around pretty quickly to where you want to go. And, oh, sorry. Oh, wait, no, no. okay. Uh, one of the places that is helpful in Wikipedia is going down and looking at the references that are listed there. That will at least get you a start. And if you are pressed for time, if you've got issues of mobility, getting out and going somewhere, you can check to see if some of these sources are available online. Some books are online and you can access them and you can read them online. And um, research in many ways has been greatly helped by the internet and by these various services that, that provide these kinds of, of links. But um, one of the things I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more, I'm probably stepping out of the, but I, I do want you to take a look at the full information that's here because you have an author, you have a title, you have a publisher, you have a publication date. All of those things matter when you are deciding, okay, which source would be helpful? Okay. And there are a lot of them. And here is where I do suggest then maybe taking a list from Wikipedia and then maybe checking into your library's search engine you know, look at what's available locally. And um, because I'm in Stevens Point and I usually go and look at the Portage County Public Library, uh, that's what I have up here, but you'll find most of these library sites look exactly the same. And you can not only find your topic, but on the side, all sorts of subtopics. And then you can get down here, um, do you want to first look for electronic books, see what's available online? Um, are you interested in historical fiction? Are you interested in juvenile works? All of those things will help you refine your search a lot quicker so that you're just not out there um, you know, flailing around and you, you're going to end up anyway with way more material than you want or you need. And I can, well, I didn't bring pictures, but I have boxes of stuff left over from projects that I just never used. 
And believe me, that's a lot better than having too little. So utilizing the library, I think is great. Even if the library in our library system is hooked up to a lot of other libraries, so you can put a hold on something, it will come in for you. Um, you can also use an interlibrary loan process where even if it's outside of the system, you can ask for it to be sent in. So even if you are only ever in central Wisconsin, you can get a lot of work done. And when I was pointing out the author title publication information, um, this is one of the reasons why. And when I was teaching, one of the courses I used to teach was for history majors and minors about writing history. And this was one of the lessons that I tried to get in early and often during the semester was always evaluating, not just choosing, but evaluating what, what are referred to as secondary sources. And these are the, the books that you would use as background material. These are the works of history. Somebody else has already written them, but you need them. You need them for your own background material. And there is kind of a quick way of checking, would this be a good, reliable source to use? So you look, and, and some of this information, again, you can get on the website. I happen to own Susan's book because I've known her for years. Um, so you look at the title, you look at the author, you look at the, all of this on the, the title page, you look at who published it. Well, Oxford University Press, okay? Um, Oxford is not going to publish something that isn't good. Um, and I can say that from personal experience as well as from Susan Brewer's experience, they, they do get the best authors. And then you can do a quick check on the bio of the person. What are their credentials for writing this book? It doesn't mean that all books and all authors have to be academics and have to be um, credentialed like that. But if you're going for the very best background source information, and maybe I'm a little snobby about this, but I say, go to the academics. Not all of their writing is dry and hard to get through. Some of it is, um, you know, and I've read plenty of it. I hope I haven't written any of it, but I've read plenty of it. Um, but even if it's dry, you're going to find a lot of good information in there. So when you see this kind of biography on a flyleaf, so-and-so is a university professor, they have a PhD, you know that they've been trained in the kind of research skills that you want for your own book. So why not get it from the best? Okay, and this is, um, this may narrow your secondary source material, but narrowing it is also going to be helpful for you not getting buried under it. So do be very careful about choosing what kinds of secondary sources that you use. And the other kinds of sources, and actually one more thing before I, before I leave secondary sources, um, as you are accumulating the sources, even if you're not sure you're going to use it, start from the very beginning of your project, drafting what's known as a bibliography. You saw that word on the Wikipedia site and then the list of books. As close to the beginning of your project as you can, start keeping a list of the sources that you think you'll be using, that you are using, because this will come in handy by the end of your project when you have to submit this kind of thing to a publisher. They wanna see what your sources are. And believe me, after you've spent all this time researching and writing, the last thing you wanna do when you're finished writing your book is to try and reconstruct your source material. You'll go crazy. Um, it, it just gets so, it's very time consuming to go back and do something if you can just start it at the beginning of the project. So 
do that. Do it with your secondary sources, but also do it with your primary sources. So these are just a couple of examples. Um, I know the, the two of you are not working on real old projects. So, and I have to admit, I kind of shy away from anything earlier than the 20th century because although I do know cursive handwriting, um, the further back you go with it, the more challenging it is to read it. And I have two examples here. Um, the one over here, this is um, Abigail Adams, uh, one of her letters. And um, the one on the right is um, Mary Chestnut, the Civil War diarist. So um, primary means the source was generated in the time period that you're writing about. So if you have a collection of family letters, okay, those are all primary sources. And for historians, history writers, this is the fun stuff. This is the stuff that really starts getting your heart racing when you, when you read through it, because you actually get a feel for the person and the times. So when you start collecting your primary sources, you do the same thing. You build that into your bibliography. And um, the way we were taught when we were researching was basically, you know, one, and we were, and I still do use note cards, one note card per source. So, you know, each letter that, that you're going through, you know, you would write out uh, an entry for it. So it just, again, it just helps as you're amassing your sources and it's a way to keep them all straight and all separate. And in terms of where you find these sources, now some people of course are very lucky that these are family things. You know, you go, um, you go in, and I've heard these stories of people who literally in their attics, in their basements, there are trunks full of old letters. And so people have built stories out of that. They have, they have sometimes contributed to an archives, you know, turned over family letters and said, you know, this person lived here for 70 years and here are their letters. And archives come in different shapes and forms. Some are very personal family-based ones, but a lot of them are publicly accessible. So. We're sitting in one of those right now. So if you were doing a local history project, one of the first things you might want to do is to take a look, is there a historical society nearby and contact that historical society. When I was talking about secondary sources and library research, um, research librarians are your friends and they do really like to help people as long as you know, you approach them properly, ask nicely for their help. Um, usually they are just wonderful to work with. And the same is true at archives. Archivists, they are busy cataloging and, and doing their work, but they are also there to help researchers. Okay. So institutions like this, oops, also, um, the National Archives, I have been there. I have researched at the National Archives. It can be extremely overwhelming. Um, I've been to the facility in Maryland, uh, at College Park, Maryland, and it, you really have to prepare well to go in, but you can also request items electronically, and it, it takes more time than we have this afternoon to even navigate through their website to figure out how to do that. Um, so if you think you've got some documents at a more national level, I would say it's very much worth your time to go into this website and to start <clears throat> looking around. And um, have you ever been to the library? Yes, I've been to the Library of Congress too. And that's also a beautiful place to research. And um, as far as the National Archives, military records are yes. very good to get from the National Archives. 
Yes, and I did that uh, when I was working on Angels of the Underground. Um, I, that may have been the last time I was at College Park. And yes, a tremendous collection there. And the, um, the archivists who work there sometime, and again, we were talking about this before, they're, they're tremendously overworked and overwhelmed, especially by COVID, but extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> it does help though, the more you do, preliminary research and like you have to know record groups, you have to know this. You, I mean, you, you have to be armed with as much information as possible about the sources that you're looking for. Um, you know, in the old days, I just used to print off stuff from the National Archives website. Every time I would find something, I would, you know, I'd see the, the collection number or whatever, and I'd just start printing off pages so that I had physical documentation, it does exist. I and mean, this is where it is. So that if later I was filling out online forms, um, I, I had that to refer to. So it is vast and, and it can get a little bit overwhelming and it may take you time to navigate through it, but it's well worth the time. Um, the Library of Congress, I've researched there too. They have amazing collections um, and very helpful staff there as well. And if you ever, that's the one thing the Library of Congress has over the National Archives, at least College Park, um, but the Library of Congress, the reading room there, you really feel like you've made it as, yes. a, as a researcher when you have a, a spot at one of the tables there. It's great. Um, so the, um, the National Archives is a great place to get these kinds of primary sources from, and they do have some things available electronically. They do have some things that, yes, you have to pay a fee for them to scan and send you a PDF or a JPEG. But I've, um, again, when I was working on um, Angels of the Underground, photographs, which were very easy to get, you need some lead time, but high quality scans that were, you know, useful for including in the book. So those kinds of things available. And the other, the other thing, and this, this goes back to our, our library searches, but oral histories. Um, this is not something that I'm particularly good working with. Um, I often say I, I prefer working on stories about people who are long dead because then I, I don't feel so bad about not setting up oral histories. I, I'm not like, I'm, I'm not trained in journalism. Journalists are really good at interviewing people. Um, I'm not, but some people just love sitting down with other people and talking. And you can do this again, much more easily these days, even if you have to do it like with Zoom, it's easy to record things now. Um, but if you can't do that, you can find oral histories that would be pertinent to your project, things that are already collected and available in book form. So I would say don't discount those. You do have to be careful because you have to realize somebody else was asking the questions. They might not be the same questions you would have asked, but if you can work with them, why not do them? And, and again, they come in a wide variety. Um, I think it's been DC Everest. The, the students there used to do these amazing uh, oral history projects and, and you can get a wide variety of, of these collections. So I would say, look for those. I have the phrase oral histories up here, but when I've, over the years as I've been doing library searches for my various projects and looking for these kinds of things, or um, not just oral histories, but if I wanted to find other diaries or even letter collections, the key search phrase that I always found extraordinarily helpful was personal narratives. So if you do a search, say, um, when I was working on Dr. Mary Walker, the Civil War physician, and I wanted to know about other women doctors in the Civil War, I would do a, a search with the terms, you know, Civil War physicians or medical care, women, 
personal narratives. So you start stringing together those terms, but I've always found that personal narratives was the key to turning up the primary sources that were available maybe in book form or some kind of easily accessible form. And that has saved me a lot of headaches um, in, in doing research and getting to things much more quickly. The other, oops, the other real gold mine that I have, and I started using this again with Angels of the Underground, um, women who were working against the Japanese in the Philippines during World War II, and this extended into my Mary Walker project and also into my Dale Evans project, I was using Ancestry.com. And um, this, this does get a little bit more difficult unless you actually get a subscription to it. You can get a personal subscription. I'm sorry, I don't know the cost offhand, but I think you can do it month by month. So if you can be very focused with your research, you may not be out of pocket very much money, you know, maybe one month, maybe two, if you can be very systematic and know ahead of time what you want when you go in there, you won't just have to keep paying month by month. But I have found it extremely helpful. And this is just the basic page. And actually, um, I think, again, at, Portage, at the Portage County Public Library, I think you can use this in the library if you have, you know, if, if you're using one of, or, or even if you're on your own computer, but you have to be in the library to use logged it in. and logged in the to the library website. So that'll get you there. Um, Marathon County had it during COVID. And I think this was something that Ancestry was doing to you know, cope with COVID type thing. But those kinds of services are not necessarily available anymore. Um, Cautionary um, comment. Use the primary sources. Don't rely on anybody's family trees. Yes. Because, well, I, I've been on Ancestry for, well, almost 20 years, since about 2003 or 2004. And I, I did all of my research primary. I mean, I went mm -hmm. out and I got birth certificates. I looked, you know, for deeds and land, I mean, land records and probate records. And, you know, I also transcribed them a lot of times onto the person's, my ancestor's particular profile page, but a lot of people don't do that. Yeah. And, and so you have to be really careful as to what type of information you want to pick up from somebody else's tree. Yes. You know, make, you know I, I don't usually put anybody else's information into my tree unless I, I have my own source or have checked it by some other means. Yeah. And, but there are a lot of people that don't do that. And they just bring in sometimes multiple people of the same name, but they might be from all different states. Mm -hmm. And they put those into their family tree and say, that's my ancestor, or that's you know a brother or sister of my ancestor. And so use ancestry for their collections of vital records or primary sources or even secondary sources. They have good secondary secondary sources, but don't. I, I wouldn't rely on anybody's trees unless you check it yourself. Right. And this, the check it yourself, I mean, this, this goes back to always double check any yeah. piece of information you have. And I was going to, I have other caveats about ancestry, but um, this was one I hadn't thought of, but it's one I confronted just a few days ago because I found, I, I found my father's name and somebody had built a family tree and it is, I, I wouldn't say wildly incorrect, but it is so partially correct, and I have no idea who did it. And and it's it's just it was just weird. Um, so anyway, yes, and this is again a cautionary tale about how you use any source. You always double check. You never think, oh, I've got this, and this is perfect. Always find out is it really that perfect? But on the other hand, um, this is a great place to start. You know, you've got, you start with names, 
you start with a place the person might live, their birth year, and, and especially even getting kind of close to a birth year will save you from being inundated with possible matches. One of the caveats I was going to bring up was um, the spelling of names. Oftentimes, and one of my favorite things to get from Ancestry are the census records. And this um, census records prove to be um, extraordinarily helpful when I was working on uh, Dale Evans' book. And um, the issue of names, though, was there are, there are so many pitfalls, especially with census records, census takers, they misspell things. Mm -hmm. They they do get things wrong, and this is another cautionary tale about going over your source material. So this is just an example of what happened when I went on Ancestry and started searching. So um, Dale Evans's birth name was Frances Octavius Smith. Okay. I know when and where she was born. Um, you know, unfortunately, for a long time, Uvalde was only famous because that was her birthplace. Um, and then you see what starts to turn up then in terms of uh, Dale Evans. Um, so her background, what, what did I need to know? And um, so yeah, she does. She turns up in the census. Um, she turns up social security. And you notice the social security claims. Um, there are now two different last names there. So we know that she was married more than once. And um, if I hadn't already known those other married names, I would have had a signal from here. And again, this is, this is how you start. And so then I would go, okay, and then I would um, follow her through everything I could find with Francis Smith, then Francis Johns, then Francis Butts, you know, all of that. So, and, and when you see down here on the filters, you get a sense of what is available at Ancestry. Um, so yeah, for this book, it was mostly this, uh, the census lists, um, military, I, I really didn't need it for that, but um, the military records came in very handy when I was working on Angels of the <clears throat> Underground because um, the women that I wrote about in there, they talked a lot, a lot about the men that they met in the Philippines who were members of the army and the navy. And I could check, you know, I, I had a name, I had to check and see. How accurate were their memories? Did these men really exist? And I could look at their, and not all of their military records, but I could see their enlistment records. Um, very, this came in very handy. So I would say at some point, especially if you're working on a family project or a biography, ancestry is going to be very helpful. Now, there is also, a list under those filters of newspapers and periodicals. And you can see uh, links to those when you use Ancestry, but um, okay, thank you. Um, actually, I'm just giving you kind of my favorites. There are other things, but, and I am not sponsored by any of these organizations. Um, I have found it to be very helpful to work with newspapers.com. And again, this is, I think, something you can get through um, some public libraries. And it's a, it's a huge um, range. I mean, it, it goes from the 1800s up until about present day. And once, especially once Dale Evans became Dale Evans, this is how I tracked her. And believe me, this, this took a long time. But I was not only going year by year searching with her name, and as luck would have it, Dale Evans was not a very common name. Um, I think there was a, one other Dale Evans who happened to turn up in some newspapers now and then, um, but I could quickly figure out that this was not somebody I needed to pay attention to. So luckily, you know, I mean, if her name still had been Smith her whole life, I'd still be researching the book. But anyway, um, and newspapers.com, 
I found so helpful that I actually went beyond the library version of it because I found out that the library version and the version you pay for individually is different. The one you pony up the money for has more newspapers. And in my case, more newspapers that were germane to my topic. So I, I paid. And I was, I was happy to do it. Again, I focused, how long is it going to take me to do this research? And I, I paid for what I needed. And then if I needed to go back to it, I had kept my note cards. And I had the library version to, to rely on. But you can see here, uh, Dale Evans here, 1945 to 1946. But I, I actually went through month by month. Uh, within each year. Uh, I just did this to show you what would come up. And um, I could see, for example, what was being written about her in newspapers. I could also see the kinds of um, ads the, the movie theaters were running, uh, the films that were showing at, at any given time. And this, this is also one of the things that I find extremely important. Um, the contextual information. This is why I love newspapers so much. Maybe even more than letters and diaries. Maybe just a little bit more because of the context. So here is, you know, here's that article that, that popped up in the search, right? So I can find out why Dale Evans is queen to Roy's king. And this is, you know, this is a great publicity piece for her and everything. But the other thing I like about this is then I can kind of read through this newspaper and see what else was going on at the time that this story came out. Is there anything else helpful? Um, the, uh, this is the Valley Times from California. So this was actually sort of in Dale's backyard. So this is kind of a hometown newspaper for her in the LA area. So I could get a feel for what was happening in the area. And this also is extremely helpful, especially if you can't be there. Like I couldn't, well, I could, but I didn't really have the time to go out to LA to just walk the, the neighborhoods and, you know, get that kind of feel, but I could get it from the newspaper. And this was the kind of contextual information that I found so helpful and valuable in that project. And so you can you can go you can go beyond this page in newspapers.com, you can go before it and you can kind of read up on, on what's there. Which um, <laughs> kind of leads me to this. I, and again, I, I think I've been giving some warnings as I've been going along. Uh, and writers always kind of ruefully laugh about this as they're working on their projects, those research rabbit holes. And you know, if, if you read too much contextual information, you do run the risk of falling down one of these things. And um, it can be good and bad. I found some research rabbit holes to be very helpful, actually, and some that I spend sometimes, you know, two hours chasing down something that I thought was interesting, only to find out it really doesn't have anything to do with my project. And I didn't need to do that. Yeah, it might have been interesting, but maybe not. And so I've got a little bit of an example for this as I show about how to organize things. And as I mentioned before, I literally still do use physical note cards. And um, I don't even know if it's an age thing because there are people my age I know who have migrated to using their computers with much more facility than I do um, and using various programs um, to virtually organize all of their notes. I, I can't work like that. So my advice always is to find what works for you and to use it. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Don't worry about these snazzy new programs that can do this for you, that for you. If you don't
that comes from a book I was, I've just been reading called Inventing the It Girl. Um, it's pretty fabulous, but you can see on one side is from the, the story itself and you see these, these uh, super scripted numbers. Okay, we, and we know what that means then, that there is corresponding source material. And your publisher will expect, at, you know, in some way, shape, or form, that's going to be in your book. So as I said, you don't want to be reconstructing that at the end of your project. That's what you collect as you go along, because that's how it's going to end up looking. And even if you end up publishing it on your own, you are going, because it's a true story, you are going to want to reassure your reader that this is based on good sources. So show it off, you know, show your work. How, how often were we told that in grade school, right? Doing a math problem, show your work. You're writing history, show your sources. So um, that's, that's a lot on the researching. And I do wanna talk some um, about writing, which in many ways is even harder to talk about than research. Because I think, well, and maybe this is what they both have in common. Um, you do research and writing long enough, you get it right. Maybe you get it more right with research more quickly because you learn. Writing is more about style and that I think takes a lot longer. So when I'm preparing to write something, even after having written many books, every project to me is totally new. I go through the same frustrations each book. I, and honestly, after my first book, I thought, oh, my second book will be so much easier. It wasn't. And I thought, well, certainly my third book, nope. Um, it's always to me. Um, a long slog and yet I still keep doing it. So something must be interesting, but I like to have guides as I go. And I do like them to be witty and informative so that I don't feel like I'm slogging too much. And so just a couple of my personal favorites, um, Eats, Shoots and Leaves, which has been out for a long time. Um, you know, just a, a nice kind of style guide that's written in a, engaging format. More recently, um, Benjamin Dreyer's book, Dreyer's English, is just wonderful. Um, and I do, I do have a part of a shelf in my bookcase that has style, and, you know, writing books. Again, I don't overwhelm myself with them because there are tons of them. I also have the basic uh, strunk and white elements of style. So, you know, I would say just with a, a couple of good style manuals, you'll be fine. You don't have to overwhelm yourself. I also try not to overwhelm myself with inspirational writing books or how-to books, but these are three that I have found helpful. Uh, voice and vision, and actually some of the things that I'm talking about in terms of writing do come from uh, Stephen Pine's book. I, I have to learn from people who know this stuff better than I do. And a lot of what I've done how I've learned it has come through voice and vision, um, which again, it's not a very thick book. It moves pretty quickly. It's a nice thing to have on hand if you just want a little bit of inspiration. Um, but he is, he is very tied into serious narrative nonfiction, which um, is for him history. If you want something a little bit more creative, uh, I did, revisit Robin Black's book called Crash Course, which is um, kind of a blend of memoir and writing guide. And I, I think that she is, um, she is just wonderful. And I compare a lot of things in the writing life to Stephen King, which I really shouldn't because only Stephen King is Stephen King. Um, but his I was actually pleasantly surprised with his book on writing because it's not about on writing horror and you know those kinds of books. It's just about the writing life. And you have to kind of get past the fact that he is Stephen King, so different rules apply to him, but he is very good about the process of writing. And so that's why I do continue to recommend his book to people who are interested in 
writing, whether you're just becoming a writer or um, you have been a writer. So, you know, then where do you start? And in writing circles, uh, usually somewhere at the beginning, you face this question of whether you're a plotter or a pantser, okay? And I would say at some point in your process, even if you don't start out that way, at the end, you're gonna end up as a plotter because you're gonna end up somewhere, somehow with an outline like this. You'll have to for your finished project, for your finished product, right? Because you, you'll have to have a table of contents. You have to have some way of guiding your reader through your book, but you don't have to start out that way. Some people are perfectly happy flying by the seat of their pants. They're, they're gathering their research materials, primary sources, secondary sources. They come across a letter or a diary entry and they're just inspired to start writing about it. They get a few pages written and they think, okay, so I'll, I'll use that maybe for some chapter and set it aside and they go on to do something else. And that's fine. If you're a pantser, you know, go ahead and just let it flow, let the writing happen. If you're a plotter, get that organization down before you start. Lay out your sources and say, where's the beginning of my story? Where's the middle? Where's, you know, where's the critical point? Where, what, where do things change? And then where does it end? Um, I write biography. So for me, I kind of have a basic, <laughs> Uh, I have a basic timeline there. I always know where it's going to end. Uh, and sometimes, well, lots of times I'm very sad by the time I get to that point, but um, I know how it ends. Uh, but outlines are remarkably helpful. Again, something we probably all learned back in grade school, dust off those skills and outline again. It may help you move quicker through your project. 